So today I'm going to be talking about uh, re-hosting applications between Kubernetes clusters uh, using Crane. My name is Marco Berube. I'm the product manager for migration toolings at Red Hat. Um, and Crane is a new project uh, to, that is actually related to a current tool we have inside Red Hat. It's called MTC. Uh, but Crane is this new upstream project that uh, like based on everything we learned on MTC, like it's, it's actually going to help us like increase the scope of what we can do from a migration point of view. Um, so from an agenda point of view, uh, I'm just going to quickly go over what is actually Crane, uh, some of the use cases, uh, the introduction to the Crane commands and how the tool works. Uh, and then Eric Nelson, which is the engineering manager for this tool, is going to go through a more deep dive demo of the tool and how it works. And uh, yeah, and we'll go from there. So and, and let us know if you have questions. Uh, and we'll answer questions at the end with uh, some Q&A. Um, so quick update on, on Crane. So, so Crane is a project in the conveyor community, as you might expect. Uh, uh, but it's to help migrate applications from all kinds of Kubernetes flavors to Kubernetes or OpenShift. Uh, so I so just want to point out that actually MTC 1x is, is not Crane, right? So MTC was built. And we started the MT. So if you're familiar with MTC, which was the, the downstream Red Hat project, which was called Migration Toolkit for Containers, or MTC for short, this tool was built for OpenShift to OpenShift migration only, and mostly for the purpose of of, of, of the Red Hat customers migrating from OpenShift three to OpenShift four. Uh, but as we've been working on this for a significant amount of time and did a lot of migrations, we learned a lot. And, and, and now we're kind of re-implementing this knowledge of everything we learned on that tool in this new upstream project crane um, that we hope is going to be built on uh, like all, all the latest and greatest and everything we learned to make this tool even better and with a bigger scope, which is uh, any Kubernetes to any Kubernetes uh, flavor migration. Um, so Crane doesn't have a downstream product name yet inside Red Hat. So right now it's just an upstream project, and uh, but we expect that will happen uh, later this year and have something also downstream as everything we do upstream becomes a typically like a product downstream, then uh, that should happen around spring 2022. Uh, but uh, stay tuned for what this will be named and what how this will be delivered. But for now, let's talk about the upstream Crane project. and. Crane right now, the expectation is uh, will be uh, a mix of some common line power tools or a way to do more advanced type of migrations. And in the future, it also could be leveraged with some kind of uh, downstream like up, OpenShift a easy button type of migration as we make, we want to make this actually in part, part of the OpenShift product in the future as, as a way to easily migrate applications between OpenShift clusters as well using the same technology. So let's let's talk a little bit about the lesson learned, right? From from all the work we've done so far with this engineering team for a couple for two years now, um, and and the most some of the most requested features that sometimes we couldn't deliver uh, in an MTC fashion because of the way we actually started this project and the current architecture or limitation that we had and the way we build this tool. So the first one is the admin uh, requirement. Um, so today, the, the, one of the issues we've been having with MTC is you need cluster admin privileges. And, and we heard loud and clear from many people that actually they wanted their developers or app owners to do their own migration. Uh, so this is one of the key thing we want to solve with Crane is to allow uh, developers or app owners or people without cluster admin privileges to actually migrate their own application. Um, Another thing is uh, we would like to, I would like to provision this application from pipeline, but only migrate my, my state. So this is something we've actually solved in MTC, but uh, something that is going to be even easier to do uh, using the crane commands so that if you can, if you want to reprovision from pipeline, but only using this tool to migrate the state or your PVs, then you, you will be allowed to do that pretty easily using the crane tool. Um, also, one other thing we found is in the first place, like, and I'll touch on the next slides in more details, but typically, technically, like in many cases, you should not need a migration tool, right? Like if you would have automate, automation, if you would have automated deployments and pipelines, then you could just reprovision this application to another cluster. But if you don't have that, like how Crane could help you actually achieve that. So 
as you are migrating from one cluster to another, like the current version of MTC, like it just brings it migrate, it's helping you migrate from one cluster to another, but your end state is the exact state, same state as you were on the first cluster. You're now just locked in into another cluster. So with Crane, we want to automatically help you build some automated deployments and following GitOps uh, methodology so that you, at the end, after the migration is completed, uh, you are improving your situation. And we also want to make sure that this is as easy as possible to troubleshoot. We made significant improvement uh, over the over the years with MTC, but still, uh, we believe that with Crane and the current and the new architecture is going to be even better and easier to troubleshoot uh, my, anything that could go wrong during a migration process. As as we understand that, like you could have downtime, and this could be in a maintenance window. So anytime we can save troubleshooting and fixing issues is actually a very good thing when you are migrating applications. So that's one of the other key thing we we're thinking about while building this project or this new architecture for Crane. So again, as I touched on the previous slides, so, but why do you actually even need a migration tool in the first place, right? So, so if you have automated deployments, then obviously migrating from pipeline is the best approach. So, but we found that many applications don't have that and this is why you end up having a need for a migration tool. Also, even if you have automated deployments, you might have state. So. If, if you want to uh, provision your applications for, for, from one cluster to another, but you need to migrate your state, this also could be another reason why you would need a migration tool uh, to help you with that, uh, to migrate the, the data from, from one cluster to another. Um, and this is, this is what we found like so far over the years, um, that is the current situation with a lot of customers that we're seeing using Kubernetes. So, so typically, like over the years, you've had installed and deployed many applications and some of those applications and a small subset will have some automated deployment, right? So this is like, typically that would be your most important apps and, and those ones would have a way to, you would get automated deployments and will be promoted from dev to QE to production. But there's a larger subset of those apps, um, and we've done surveys, like with also in previous sessions, right, asking like the percentage of your application that have automated deployment versus not not having automated deployment. And this is pretty good ballpark in in many many uh, clusters or customers as we're seeing today. So the issue is that all those manually deployed applications become pets, right, and they have art coded information and which can be IP addresses and metadata information specific to the cluster they're running on. And this is what make them pets and make them very difficult to actually move from one cluster to another. And, and as soon as this cluster that you're running it on, you need to, for some reason, upgrade it, or you want to migrate those apps from on-premise to the cloud or from one cloud to another, it makes it, that makes it very difficult to embrace this hybrid cloud approach um, as you are locked in with all those manually deployed apps. And this is this is one of the problems we, we want to solve, right? As as right now, if even if you can, for example, reprovision from pipeline your application that have automated deployment, and then you could use a migration tool to migrate your apps that have been manually deployed from one cluster to another, the end state is still the same. You have the exact same configuration that you had before. Where where we want to get you to is after the migration create for you some automated deployment so that in the future, you don't need a migration tool. You have automated deployments, you have, uh, you're following a GitOps approach potentially, and this will allow you to now be more agile and to promote code from dev to production in a much faster way as you will have the proper approach of deploying applications on top of Kubernetes. So if we think about how a migration tool works, right? So and, and this is the scenario one, like the most simplistic like migration pattern. So first of all, you need to extract all the Kubernetes manifest and re-import them on the destination side. And in many cases, you have to fix them as, as they might have metadata or all kinds of things in those manifests that actually are proprietary to your source cluster. Then you would have to migrate the state or the PVs uh, from one cluster to another, and then you have the images as well. So, so as a first use case, you could use Crane just to simply do that, right? Which is also what MTC does today. Um, so you would use the Crane command to migrate all those three things uh, very simplistically. 
and then the scenario two is you can reprovision from pipeline on the destination side, right? So you have all your stuff in Git and you have a CI CD solutions. And then you can use Crane to migrate your state. If you have a database with some data in it, and if you have all kind of, if your application have, have P data with live, like an important information for you, then you can use the Crane state migration command and, and reprovision from pipeline. And if you don't, and if you are interested in actually improving your situation and have automated deployments in the future, then you can use Crane as well to reconstruct your manifest, but instead of provisioning that to your destination cluster, push that to Git and to have your CD solution to reprovision that on the destination side for you, which at the end will bring you to a much better state as you would have automated deployment. So Crane can extract your Kubernetes manifest, clean this up, push that to Git, and then leverage your CD to deploy that uh, on the destination side. And the most simplistic way, and there's many ways to use Crane, and, and, and Eric will go through um, into this into more details, but um, if you would use the most simplistic way of using Crane, you would see something like Crane export, Crane transform, Crane apply. Those are the commands that you would use to actually do those steps and to provision your manifest uh, into Git. Then you would have the Crane transfer PVC command that would transfer the PVs from source to destination. And, and yeah, and that's it. So I'll stop here. I'll, I'll let Eric provide more details about how this tool works technically from a demo point of view. Eric, are you there? Hey, everybody. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Cool. Um, all right, so um, I'm sharing my screen right now. And I'm looking at a project call, um, within the conveyor org called Crane Runner. Um, I can get more details what it, what exactly um, this is housing. but. As <clears throat> what's interesting and relevant to this call is that um, we have an, a set of examples that are inside of this um, that we'll also be publishing to our um, Crane documentation. If I can drag this over here, uh, this is our documentation site. So I'll provide links to that. Um, and we're going to add some scenarios for folks to be able to follow along what I'm going to demonstrate today. I'm only going to go through one of the most basic examples um, and, and show kind of each of the steps that Marco was just describing. But um, we, we have this sequence of scenarios that folks can run through that gradually kind of ratchet up the complexity to demonstrate one particular piece or use, use case of the tooling. Because as you mentioned, this is kind of a tool box of, um, of different utilities that can be combined in order to do like more sophisticated things rather than one uh, prescribed path. Um, although downstream um, with Red Hat, we're going to have a, an opinionated solution that will help you uh, with as Marco described, like kind of the easy button. So um, we're going to try to go through this like stateless application mirror. So we're going to be using an example um, application called Guestbook. That's kind of the classic Kubernetes example. That's not a total toy application, but um, is also like it has a Redis back end. And then it's also got a front end uh, and it's got a bit of state or it's designed to and some of its iterations um, as a Guestbook application. So it's kind of your hello world application. Next, uh, the scenarios include a, a section on how do you integrate this with customize? So once you've stripped everything out of it that's uh, cluster specific um, so that it's no longer this pet application, how do you layer back uh, in details that are relevant? Because sometimes you actually need to layer things back in, such as resource quota in information or node selectors uh, that are actually specific to your destination cluster where you want to deploy your application. Um, number three has the GitOps integration demonstration. So in that example, you actually integrate uh, with Argo CD in order to, to um, on-ramp yourself into a CD situation so that Argo itself is actually deploying rather than you directly. Um, and then finally, there's a couple stateful application examples. So migration, and then there's a stage in a migrate model where you can continuously stage your data over time while keeping your source applications up. And then finally, doing a final cutover migration so that you um, minimize your downtime and you can get the bulk of your data onto your target cluster uh, while only capturing the deltas that have been written since your initial since your last stage during the final migration. So I'm going to jump into the um, stateless application mirror. And so I'm actually not going to be following this exactly uh, because this is using um, Tecton, which is a pipeline um, project, uh, native pipelines for Kubernetes. Uh, but we're going to be using some of the um, commands that are in here. And, and we'll also be adding a Crane 101 scenario to this shortly. I think there's actually even a PR out there um, to add that. But uh, so the first step that we have is um, in my environment, I'm going to be running a, um, a couple of Minikube clusters. So this is a really convenient way to get started. 
You can bring a, a VM like a RHEL or a Fedora VM. Um, maybe you launch it in EC2. We've actually tested that and have some documentation around recommendations for that. But I'm just going to be running on a box that I have at my house. Um, and what this script does is it actually launches two different Minikube clusters onto, on the same machine. I'm going to be using Podman as my, um, as my provider. And it's got some networking rules that are necessary for um, routing as well as DNS in order for both of those clusters to be able to see one another. Um, so, and I can, um, I can point folks to this. So if you want to take a look at exactly what this is doing, uh, there's kind of some guards in place here, but, um, it, it's for the most part, it's doing as I, as I mentioned. So we're bringing up the source and destination cluster and setting up the networking. Um, so I actually already have that set up in this environment. So I'm in my machine. Uh, this is a Fedora machine that I freshly set up and installed Podman on. So I have a couple aliases. Um, MK is my mini cube. Um, I use a couple tools. KX is a tool called Cube Context that's really convenient for switching between um, Kubernetes contexts. And then KN is um, my uh, Cube NS tool, so it's related. These are like bash scripts that get loaded, uh, and that'll help me set like my active namespace. Um, so this is kind of a function that is nice and, and part of OpenShift that we don't actually have uh, kind of natively in a similar manner. So this helps with uh, vanilla Cube environments. So um, right now I'm going to set my um, context to my source cluster. And um, let's go ahead and get started. So um, I'm going to skip over installing Tecton because we're not, not going to use it in this uh, in this example. And then um, I also am not going to be installing um, Crane Runner manifests because again, those are cluster tasks that are related to Tecton. Um, what I am going to install is the, is my um, example uh, example application workload. So I'm going to run a command to create my guestbook namespace on the source side. And then secondly, what I'm going to do is run a customize command that um, pulls in the um, guestbook application and installs it on my source cluster here. So uh, the customize command is just layering in some details. I think I think it's bundled as a customize, um, it's, which means it's organized um, uh, in such a way that customize it's customize aware. And so this instantiates it, and then I'm going to pipe it into my cube uh, cube cuddle command uh, to to create that on the source side. So now you can see that my active namespace is the get book. And if I run a get pods here, um, they're all actually running already. Um, under normal circumstances, you have to pull this so it takes longer. I actually ran through this already once. So I've got all the images on my machine. So fortunately, we can benefit from that stuff coming up quickly. So I've got a front end, um, a Redis master, and a couple of Redis slaves. Um, so this last uh, command will just let, like block until everything comes up as ready. This doesn't happen to be ready. Um, so now we can get ready for our application mirror. So now what I'm going to go do is create a um, contact, a, a namespace, a guestbook namespace on my target cluster uh, to house the guestbook application. So my goal here is to mirror this application onto my target side. Um, so at that point, um, we should be ready to actually get started using Crane. So you can um, go find Crane at uh, in Conveyor um, Crane, and we have a sequence of uh, releases here. Our current release is Alpha 2. We are expecting an Alpha 3 release pretty soon here. Um, but each, with each release, we'll have release notes, and um, we're adding new features as we go along. So you can download. Um, this is the binary directly, so it's a Go binary. It doesn't need any dependencies. You can download it, make it executable. And then um, it should be available to you to use. So I've added it uh, to my path on this particular machine. So if I run a crane version on here, you'll see that um, I'm using crane version um, 003. And then I've got a crane lib, which is where a lot of the logic is implemented. So it can be utilized by other projects as 005. So um, crane itself, the command, has several, uh, several commands that you can run. Um, the ones that we're interested in today are the primary uh, migration commands. So that's going to be export, which exports the raw application, uh, raw application resources that it finds within the namespace that you specify to disk. And then secondly, we're going to run transform. So transform is the piece that um, generates a set of JSON patches as dictated by the plugins that you have installed. We use a plugin model because um, if I'll, I'll just describe a little bit of background around this. It's pretty frequent when you're when you're approaching different environments um, that everybody's kind of got one-off problems, and so in an effort to build a generic uh, tool, but 
uh, one that also services people with specific needs, we've decided to build this around a plugin model. So the cool thing about that is um, if folks end up discovering particular issues for themselves or they have like really specific needs, um, the plugin API is very uh, simple for folks to go out and build plugins for themselves to solve their, solve their own issues. And then secondly, they can go and actually pull down plugins that have already been written so that the community can codify those the solutions to those problems within plugins and share them so they're easily um, easily uh, accessible to the rest of the community. So we the, the crane command itself actually ships with a couple of default, well, actually it ships with one plugin that's built into it. And then secondly, it has a, a default repository where we are publishing kind of our official uh, plugins. So the, the plugin that's built directly into crane is the Kubernetes plugin. So there's a whole set of like, um, cleaning operations that we know already are going to be necessary for um, Kubernetes, things like um, owner references, stripping like uh, derivative resources from owner references. So an example of that would be a replica set in a pod. Um, what you actually want to do is restore the replica set on the target side rather than actually and, and allow the, the target cluster controllers to recreate those derivative resources such as the pods. So we want to strip those from your manifests so you're not recreating those. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, so that's kind of an example of a Kubernetes transform. A second example is uh, once you get into OpenShift, you start to talk about routes or OpenShift specific resources. And so there's operations that you want to include there. However, it's an optional plugin. So you can uh, decide to use it or not, depending on whether or not your target environment is an OpenShift cluster. And then, of course, you can get more and more specific. Um, so you can build plugins for things like node selectors or your own specific environments. Um, all right. So um, I'm going to get started here. Let's go into my working directory. Um, I think I have a demo directory. I've run this one time previously, so I'm going to RMRF that whole directory just to start clean. And so we, um, we're starting clean, and I'm going to set my context to the source cluster, and I'm going to set my namespace to the guestbook. I think it was already done, but I'll just make sure of that. So we'll start with crane export. Um, I'm realizing I'm actually forgetting the third command, which is apply. We'll talk about that when we get to it, but it, it's effectively the application and the JSON patches that are generated against the raw resources to, to produce your output, which is a cluster agnostic set of manifests that, that can then be recreated. So uh, crane export itself um, exports the raw um, resources. So you can see it's going in and it's actually using the Kubernetes API server's discovery API to understand what are all of the applicate, like all the API resources that are available. Um, and then from there, it'll go through and it'll make sure to export that. So the cool thing there is that it'll actually support uh, CRDs as well um, because it'll, it'll be able to find those based on the discovery API. So I'm gonna run a tree here. Um, and so you can see these are all of the raw resources that it just found within my guestbook uh, namespace. So I've got things like underlying pods that have been generated as a result of replica sets. I've got endpoints and endpoint slices that have been uh, generated as a result of the services. And if I go and um, look at one of those, I'll take a look at the, let's look at the Redis master here. Um, you'll see there's cluster specifics here. So I have an IP address and that IP address may not be relevant within a target cluster. Um, so it's cluster specific information that I'm gonna wanna strip before I version it and, and get that into something like a CD system. So, okay, so now I've got my raw resources and that can be useful in itself just for exporting um, your applications uh, and the resources that make them up uh, for your own purposes. But um, now I'm actually gonna run a crane transform. But before I do that, um, I want to take a look at the plugins that it's going to run. So um, I'm just using Crane, the default um, binary that I downloaded. I haven't installed any custom plugins, but what I actually do have is a um, there's a there's a plugin management command here so that it can discover plugins and you can easily install them. And then um, lastly, so you can run a list plugins command when you do the transform command to so that the tooling will tell you, hey, these are the plugins that I'm going to use when you run your transform command. Um, so we can run that now. Uh, you can see um, the only plugin that I've got right now is the one that's baked into Crane, um, and that's the Kubernetes plugin. So this will perform all of the logic that we know that we need to do when we're doing a Kubernetes mi uh, migration. So I'm going to run Crane Transform right now. Um, most of the default um, the default arguments are acceptable to me in this scenario. Um, there's a lot of configuration that I don't really want to get into right now. Um, so you can see here that uh, 
a lot of work was done here. Um, one of the examples here is that like the underlying endpoints, because these are derivative resources of uh, a service, those are going to get um, white out files. And what that means is that they're going to get blocked when I do my the application of these transforms so that uh, they're effectively stripped from my um, output manif set of manifests because I'm not going to need those. Similarly, I'm going to have the same thing with pods. Um, so we can run a tree command on transform. And uh, so here are the JSON patch files uh, that I've got. So let's take a quick look at one of those. Um, probably looking at the Redis master is helpful. So here are the JSON uh, patch commands that it's going to run. And these were all uh, created as a result of the plugins. Um, so it's going to do things like strip my metadata. Um, the status is no longer relevant once I version it. So it's really just kind of cleaning up these, these exported uh, resources. And then another item um, here is, I'm sorry, I'm looking at a deployment. Um, we're going to want to strip the cluster specific IPs from these services. So uh, here you go. So um, you can see here, we remove a cluster IP because we know that that's not something that we want um, to get created uh, once we instantiate these on the target side. So I've got this uh, set of whiteout files plus my JSON patches in order to manipulate my um, raw exported resources to turn them into a cluster agnostic manifest. So the next step is to run a crane apply command, which is going to do that. Um, you can kind of think of this as um, I have like kind of a useful function here. Um, if folks can see this, apply is really, uh, you can think of it as an identitant function, meaning that I can rerun this over and over and over again. And as long as my inputs are the same, my outputs are the same. This also doesn't have any side effects, so it's not going to be impacting the applications that are running inside of my clusters. It's all happening um, on the command line uh, and in my local environment, which in our experience is kind of paramount when you're doing these migrations. You really want to be careful about um, altering the state of your clusters so that if things go sideways, you understand what happened and you're able to recover from that in, in an easier manner. Um, so this is going to take my raw resources as an input and the transforms that I just showed, and I'm going to get a cluster agnostic output. So if I run crane apply here, um, it does just what I mentioned. And then if I run a tree on the output, you can see a bunch of those resources have been stripped. Um, and if I actually show this side by side, we can compare the raw resources to the um, exported resources. So this is the raw output. And then on the left-hand side, I've got my stripped set of manifests. So there's quite a bit less um, on the left-hand side. And that's because, again, a lot of these are generated as a result of kind of the, the parent objects that are over here that make up my um, workload. So now what I'm going to do is um, go ahead and I'm going to apply these to my target cluster. So I'm going to set my um, destination context uh, to my desk cluster. And so if I run a, uh, if I list the namespaces here, um, I actually, oh, we, we did create the uh, guestbook namespace because I needed a destination uh, location namespace to put those in. And if I get the pods, um, there's nothing in there. So I actually, I don't have anything in this namespace. It's a fresh namespace. Just going to pause for a second. I see a, a question here. Um, what plugins do I need? When I move an uh, app from GKE to OCP, um, I think that's what it says. It's blocked. Is there an OpenShift plugin? Yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, because you're going to OpenShift from GKE, uh, you'll want to use the OpenShift plugin for that. Um, once once our product goes uh, live with it within OpenShift, it will be designed in order to do that. So you can just take the defaults and, and the OpenShift plugins already installed. If you, if you would rather use the CLI for doing that manually, um, and there are a lot of reasons to do that, you may want, um, you may have some more advanced use cases or you want, you know, finer grain control over what you're doing. Um, you'll want to uh, install the OpenShift plugin and there is an OpenShift plugin. So um, I guess I can, I can show that really quickly. So there's the plugin manager command. And so if I list my, the plugins that my plugin manager knows about, you can see that um, it because of the repositories that I have installed, I have an OpenShift plugin uh, that's available to me for install. And that's available upstream as well. OK, so um, we left off trying to recreate the cluster agnostic manifests that my apply command had output. 
in my destination cluster. So really we're doing like a basic mirroring of an application workload from the source to the destination. And that's gonna be as simple as a cube cuddle apply. Um, so if I go to my guest book, um, I'm gonna apply this, this directory. So this is just gonna cause it to create, uh, well, actually apply all of the objects that are found within this. So you can see that all these got created. Um, some of these default service accounts already existed there. So it's just complaining that they weren't already created by um, apply. So these are safe to ignore. Um, so I'll just make sure that I'm on my destination context and in my guest book namespace. And if I do a get pods, um, you can see that that has uh, launched my application on my destination namespace. So um, that's kind of the most basic of um, examples, but as Marco described, like there are definitely much more complex um, use cases for this, and it's it's really flexible. Um, and one of our favorite parts about it is that um, it's all been designed to be very transparent. Um, migrations can be ugly things, and so um, the ability to be able to diagnose problems when they arise is is really important. So that's kind of bit, it's been designed from the ground up in order to make that uh, make sure of that. I see another question in here. Do plugins only apply to the destination environment then? Um, no, so plugins will do, they're kind of, they'll do arbitrary um, mutations upon your export, exported resources. So um, the way that we've kind of been thinking about this is that the plugins often are pulling things out that are cluster specific, whereas um, you can marry this with customize in order to overlay cluster specific details of your destination clusters back into your resources. So an example of that might be um, node selectors. So the nodes that, and, and the way that they're labeled are often cluster specific. So if you would like to um, set up a node selector for your application as it gets layered in or as it gets uh, deployed to another destination, um, uh, you can use customize in order to overlay those details in. And um, customize is natively supported by things like Argo CD. So you can even um, combine customize with CD systems like Argo in order to overlay those depending which cluster you're going to. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Feel free to um, ask for clarification if, if that didn't. Jonathan, I think that's it for me. Awesome, thank you, Eric. Um, so guys, that's it. So I did put a link to a form and that will help us understand like how helpful this content was to you. If you do have any questions, there's still time to put it in the chat. Uh, I think another one just came in for you, Eric. Sure. Um, how would one do a migration if the source cluster is a database um, to the destination database with all previous data? Um, so I'll answer that assuming that you don't already have a database on your target side. Um, I'm not sure if you mean like, should, can you merge data in the target side? I'm assuming that you don't mean that. So um, we, we didn't get into the stateful uh, piece of that on this call because we really didn't have time to, and, and it probably deserves like several of, of, these in it, of these meetups in themselves because it's complex enough of a use case. Um, the stateful component of this is really kind of the difficult part when it comes to migrations. So um, if you're curious, you can actually run through some scenarios that will demonstrate that in this cube, uh, in this crane runner. Um, repository, uh, let's see here. So we have stateful application migration and then stage and migrate. So um, it depends on whether or not you're, you're already in some kind of a CD system or you want to go to a CD system. Um, let's assume you want, you already have kind of a pet application on your source cluster because that's the most common um, scenario and it's got a database. So it's, it's uh, and, and that database is on the cluster because often people will have external databases that are off cluster. So the interesting one is, is the database that has its state also within that cluster. So um, as a sequence of ta as, as a sequence of commands, and the order is relevant here, you're you'll be able to do something like transfer your PVCs using a crane command that we didn't get into here, but there is actually a transfer PVC command that will help you map PVCs from your source um, cluster to your target cluster. So what you'd be able to do in the case that you have a database is um, basically launch your namespace on the target side and then use transfer PVC to get most of your data onto the target side while the application is still up on the source. Then you can export your um, application details 
quiesce the application so you no longer have new data being written to that database and then um, run through the export transform apply to get your workload resources over to the target side do a final data um, transfer pvc which is again it's also um, it can be rerun over and over and over again in order to pick up the, the delta so in theory that one should run much faster than the initial one because it's only picking up any of the new data and then you can bring up your application on the target side so um, we didn't get into kind of those advanced uh, use cases, but we're thinking about that a lot. Um, and so that's one off the top of my head. That's how I would approach it. And we actually got a couple more questions in here, Eric. Uh, so the next one is, I assume migration is possible with Crane if target cluster is not connected. Is that correct? That is correct. So um, there's some like gotchas around uh state transfer because state transfer depends upon the clusters seeing it being able to see one another however we also have some um, tickets in order to explore what it would be like to actually export your data off of this the source cluster and then use like a sneaker net uh way mechanism to like get it into your disconnected cluster on the target uh so that it like you know maybe you want it on a on your workstation or whatever um but yeah, Crane itself, so it's you can see that I was actually operating on my workstation. So you can export, it exports all of those resources onto your onto your desktop or wherever you're running those commands. And then you can use that uh, as long as you, you know, move, take your laptop into your connected, in, into your disconnected network so that you can see that cluster, then you can actually create it. Um, so that there's a way that you can kind of operate with disconnected. Um, and then the next question, Eric, is uh, how does Crane handle scenarios where the K8 application are being run as root and we need to migrate it to OCP? That's a great question. Um, we've been thinking a lot about that as well. Um, on some level, uh, some of these applications are actually like themselves written fundamentally to expect root. And so that's that's that like tackling that problem is a little bit outside of our own domain, although we can we can make a best effort. So for example, like if, if, if the, if it fundamentally expects root, like there's not a ton that we can do about that. And that's an application detail that has to be addressed. However, there are also, um, a lot of other, like, uh, one thing that comes to mind is like pod security policies, trend, like, trend, which is a Kubernetes resource and the analogous uh, resource in the OpenShift world is an SEC. So, um, we've been thinking a lot about like, this is a complex issue as you can imagine, but, um, there are kind of transforms and like permission control um, features that we can implement in Crane in order to address that. So, um, yeah, it's recognized that like OpenShift often is, is kind of a more strict environment. And so we're adding the tool sets, uh, in order to allow you to integrate with it. Thank you, Eric. And then the last one that we have so far, and I don't know if this is for you or Marco, how does Crane migration differ from the MTC tool in OpenShift? Marco, I'll bring you on just in case you have anything you want to add. Yeah, so, so right now the only downstream product is still MTC. Crane is more, for now, is only upstream. As I was saying in my in, in some of the slides, like Crane, we expect to have something downstream in spring timeframe. And the idea so far is it would be part of like in an OpenShift feature more than a product by itself. So we would like to bring this in a way that like eventually over time you would have like some kind of tool inside OpenShift that can help you migrate. So, uh, but but there's a lot of things that need to be figured out uh, before we can talk exactly of what this will exactly look like in, in the downstream. More to come in the next couple of weeks on that. All right, thank you, Marco. Um, and it looks like that's all we have for today. So everyone, thank you so much for your time. And um, remember about the Hackfest, I put the link to that up top in the comments. So other than that, we'll see you next time. Bye everyone. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks all. Bye. Thanks.